Hello, hello. <clears throat> How is everybody today? We'll give a few minutes for some people to tune in here. Hey, Don. Hey, Jeremy. Alan. How are you guys today? Um, I'm also on YouTube live. So if anybody has any questions while this is going on, after I go over uh, part two of Puppy Starting 101, um, I will answer any questions about uh, Puppy Starting. I just can't access the questions on Facebook yet. Okay. I still got a lot to learn. <laughs> but we're definitely having fun with it. We're definitely getting results. Guys, I get calls every other day thanking me, telling me, get that next book ready. Um, I got the result. Uh, Two-year-old dogs never stayed on a tree. Stay put 101. You know, they'll call me a week later. Stick in every tree. Um, over and over and over. Dog after dog after dog. I'm so passionate about this. Uh, just the other day, I'm standing outside the laundry mat because our dryer broke. And while the clothes are drying, I'm outside pacing back and forth, teaching Stay Put 101 to a gentleman from Mississippi. Because I know that if his dog at that age doesn't start doing it, she's going to hit Trader's Row. Okay? And literally, Trader's Row isn't a good place for a lot of dogs, but it's a good thing it's there because a lot of dogs get that second chance and make exceptionalness. There is a dog for every owner, every handler. Everybody likes different styles of dogs. Um, some people will call a dog, I've heard it 10 months old, only go 200 yards. Let's kill an alarm here, guys. Good thing it wasn't a dog go alarm going off. But this pup got cold at 10 months old because it wouldn't go over 200 yards. Um, if it struck a track, it'd go as deep as it needed to go. And these videos, guys, are kind of to give people information of the average of things, to know what to expect about things. So that way, pups that aren't making it are recognized. Pups that are doing everything they should be, but may have a fault in this and that, are recognized. This way, anybody who wants to can give that dog a good chance. They don't all make it. but. I've started well over 90%, 97% of every, I've had two that I couldn't start. One was heavy show blood, and it just wasn't in there to hunt. That's just all there is to it. But um, the way I start pups young, this is predatory instinct. So they really can't resist. This is what their body, their DNA is made up to do. This works with all dogs, all hunting stuff. Because if it's a good system, they're all dogs, so they'll all understand it. And everything I do, especially with my pups, isn't just starting. To me, that's next to worthless. I want to collect information while I'm starting so I can look and see what I'm going to have out of this pup. I want to know if I should be putting my time into it. Okay, There is nothing worse than spending two years on a pup that's got a couple stubborn issues, but it looks awesome. And then we realize it really never wasn't worth putting the time in. This literally makes people want to quit hunting, okay? So when we're buying a pup, whether we put a whole bunch of money in it or a little bit of money in it, we're putting a big time investment in it. If we want to breed our dogs so we don't have to buy anymore and what you hunt gets better for you what you breed gets better every generation i obedience train dogs on the third generation they're almost trained it's crazy it's called neural expressioning literally it's how their genetic their chromosomes change in the wild so that way they can pass 
environmental changes and conditions and traits that the pups need to survive rapidly. So dogs are set to rapidly change to their environment. It's a survival of the fittest technique. Um, no wild predators would live without it. Okay. So as we work with our dogs, the next generation is going to get better for us. But we need to know these things. So while I'm starting these pups, this will be a whole nother segment. I'm going to teach you guys how I'm watching things, how I test things. So that way I know what that pup's going to turn into. When they're born, as soon as they're six months old, they are what they are. Yes, they're going to change by experience, by development, adolescence. Most of them go through terrible twos. But the core things that are bred in, you are there. Um stay put is there. I test this in my six months old pups and I know what's bred in them. I use this as a tiered system. So that way, let's say I have to work on stay put. Well, I know what to breed it to because I know what level was bred in. These things are, are needed. We need to observe these things before they're hunted a whole bunch because once they're hunted, the environmental conditions. Hi, Shane. Hi, Mark. Been a while, but as a pup ages, the chance encounters and the things that happen in the woods that we can't control literally experience the dog into developing him to what he is, what he's going to be. So if we look at these things when they first start, we can see what they are, raw and wriggling. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to go over next weekend how I look into these things while I'm starting my pups. Okay. But um, right now, we're going to go over part two of Puppy Start. So I'm going to refresh everybody. What we were going over is scent wiring, okay? You can watch that on last weekend's episode. Now, what I'm going to do is, is I have a Puppy Starting program that I've developed over the years, okay? And it's a little yin and yangy. So what I did was, is I've used 30 different ways to start pups, okay? So this way I can study every aspect of starting it that way. Now, coon hunting is a scent game. They never need to see it to tree it. They never need to kill it to hunt. That's our job if we want. That is the best way to start a dog, just by scent and just hunting it. But it takes a long time because of scent belief, okay? So a lot of our dogs start quicker if we show them a cage coon or a scented cage. Now, over the years, I've done essentially too much scent starting to study it, and I've done too much Sight starting. I've made a mistake so other people does, don't have to. But I always know that I can correct it. So if I do make a mistake, I, I can balance it out because I've just been training dogs so long. And I can understand that individual dog. So some people be sitting there thinking, oh, guys, this dog's going to get ruined. And it's just like, hold on, don't worry about it. And then you know, a minute later, after I'm working with this dog, I'll just go fix that dog. Okay. Now, when we're starting puppies, I'm not doing that. I'm not fixing anything. I'm studying and starting what that dog is raw and wriggling. Okay. So everything I do with starting, whether it's sight or scent or blending the two, which is the fastest way, absolutely the fastest way, because it's about scent belief. But when I'm doing this, it's all what I call want marrying or positive reinforcement. Okay. So I'm never going to discipline that pup unless he's doing something wrong. Let's say this pup wants to nip another pup. We ain't tolerating that. Absolutely not. Okay. Now, I may correct it in a different way, but I'm not tolerating any of that. That's the only time I'm going to discipline if something's happening that shouldn't be. But what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to keep every experience positive with the pup. This means I'm not going to I'm not, I'm going to use patience. If he's pulling me, if he's dragging me, if I trip, even though I'm disabled, I'm not going to whip that pup. I'm going to use that patience and not have misplaced aggression on my pups. 
I want them to simply want that coon and that's it. And I don't want to be talking a lot. If I'm talking a lot or disciplining that dog to get on that coon or get on that tree, he doesn't want it. He's being made to. If you make them do it, they'll never do it consistently. Consistency comes from want within, their own want. That's how you get them to do it every single time. Now, here's the thing, though. We can get this same want right in our yard. It equates to the woods. Want is want. Now, I will tell you this. Drive and depth is not just bred in. No, yes, it's bred in, but it's not just bred in, okay? Everything we do absolutely needs to be bred for. If we wasn't breeding tree dogs, we wouldn't have tree dogs. Treeing is one of the most unnatural things for any dog to do. This is what makes them hound so smart. Absolutely. Dogs' bodies are built for the ground. Their whole world is on the ground. If you have an issue with your dog, and that won't stop. If you pick that dog up, as soon as his last hairs of that foot touch that ground and they disconnect, it's like a fish out of water. They will desist what they're doing. Their whole world is about the ground. They study it. They can see 300,000 times better than us. The ground, the ground, that's their whole world, okay? But when it comes to coon dogs, they have a different dimension. They look up. There's rumors that dogs can't look up. Well, I don't know exactly how that is, but I know our coon dogs tilt their head up just like that, like every dog, but they do it way more. This is a, an intelligence broadening because they're realizing that the whole world isn't on the ground. OK, this is one of the key things that why hounds are so smart and so easy to train the way I train them. But with this intelligence, we can rapidly, through want Marion, get a pup doing what we want and draw out more want. Here's the key. OK. No dog that I've ever touched wants a coon enough for me. None. Because what, how much ever they're born, how much want they're born with can always be improved upon. Now, why? This is why each individual dog's experiences develop want and drive and depth over time, okay? Some pups is just straight born with it. I like my pups to go out and come back in and check on me. So that way I know I'm on their mind because I want them to treat for me, not for them. It takes me longer to get there. Okay. So what we're going to do with this one is we're going to raise it to an astronomical level. Because want is directly tied to depth and drive. And that's a fact. Yes, we got to breed for it. But the more that dog wants it, any individual dog, the harder he's going to hunt for it. The deeper he's going to go to get it. So every dog, I'm going to improve this want and drive. And I do it right with my puppies. The dogs I start have the want of three Grand Night Champions. That's the key to getting them to start faster. That's it. The more that individual dog wants it, the less his mind is on environment and everything else and other dogs. So it's always an adrenaline issue. Okay. Now, I like to start my puppies before I do any obedience training because coon hunting is the most important. They got to treat coon to stay here. Um, plus, coon hunting broadens their intelligence. But number one, they got a tree coon to earn their food here. And I want the best. I ain't into second when it comes to dogs. I ain't competitive in much of anything. But when it comes to dogs, I've always got the best. This is because of this want marrying system I do, this foundation that I put in. Now, a lot of that talking, guys, but that's because this is very important, okay? 
Now, what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to go over the trend of how most people start their dogs. Okay. The most common things that people do. And I'm going to go over them and I'm going to explain what they're doing wrong right while I do that. And then I'm going to explain what I do with my own pups so you can understand why. This way, you know I'm talking common sense, not craziness. Always remember, if somebody tells you to do something and it does not make common sense, don't do it. Dogs are like toddlers. If it doesn't make common sense, they're not going to understand it. What trains dogs to perfection is all the information. It's stuff we all knew. It's just the hardest thing in the world to put this stuff together because we got to think simple. When it comes to the dog, this, if it's having an issue, the, the simplest question is answer. It's just the simplest cause. I'll give you an example. Young dog. Trees coon with other dogs. Trees coon with other dogs. Looks like a million bucks. Won't tree one by himself. Won't tree one by himself, night after night. Well, what's this? Some people say, I don't think he can smell it, this and that. No, they can smell it. Takes the average human being 250,000 molecules per square inch to identify a scent. Takes the average dog of all breeds six. So they can smell it. The difference is simply just the dogs. So in that case, the other dogs are giving that dog comfort, confidence. So now we know that dog's still intimidated by himself to get in that kind of a battle. That's that easy. Now, what about if we got a young dog that absolutely will tree by himself, but he won't tree with other dogs. So he'll just be there to tree sitting back. He'll just be sitting back watching the other dogs. He's whining. He's wanting to tree, but he won't get in on action. He won't get on a tree. Well, some people say, I don't think that dog thinks them dogs can tree a coon. I've heard all sorts of this stuff. And, and we think of all, I've thought all sorts of different scenarios. But then I'll stop myself and I'll think, okay, well, what's the simplest cause? What's the only difference here that I'm seeing with my own eyes, the other dogs. So in that case, it's the answer too. If he won't tree with the other dogs and he can tree his own coon, then he's intimidated by the other dogs. So he simply doesn't want to get into that battle. <laughs> it's all the same, okay? So just know tree pressure in the book or stay put 101 with other dogs completely eliminates that. OK, stay put 101 doesn't just do stay put. It does a whole bunch of different things or I wouldn't waste my time. OK, I want results and I want them fast. I'm not promised another day on this earth. So I excuse me, I have to have progress or I'm unsatisfied, satisfied with myself. And I need rapid progress. I need to see it with my eyes. This took me a long time to develop this stuff, guys. A very long time because it's it's so hard to think that simple, but that is the case. So either one of those cases, if we work a dog on a control tree, okay, no more than we need to, but it, if we do that stay put 101 like that, this gets that dog to believe his nose and stay because we've used a scented cage, okay, with his eyes to get him to believe it. Then we've used in reverse psychology by how we're pulling them off the tree and not letting them go back. So they just want it. Now, when we do that though, this also eliminates greeting you off the tree with any aged dog. It also leaves, uh, removes leaving the tree when you get there, okay? So it does several different things at once. It's tree manners is what it is. All of it. Etiquette. I'm going to stay until you get there. This happens because we're there with them. We're on the leash. We're holding them on the leash. So we're just recreating what we want to do, what we're trying to do in the woods. We're controlling it. So we're recreating it exactly how we want. So the dog gets used to it instantly as soon as we start. OK, that stay put 101 is awesome. It gets amazing results, guys. And that is the foundation where I start now.
several things I do, okay, are for many different reasons to come, okay? One thing, every time I cut my pups, I say, find it. So that way they've got a verbal cue that they can go. This sets up so that I don't need a leash later, okay? Every time I feed them a treat, I say, okay, that's an automatic yes word. Anytime they're doing something wrong, I say, ah, ah, and I use a training collar. I like a pinch chain, and I connect that to them so that way I've got verbal control, okay? Now, before I even do that, I start them in my yard, okay? What I'm going to do is, <laughs> is I'm going to blend scent and sight. Okay, here we go, guys. I need you to pay attention. All right. What we're going to do is, is we're going to blend the two so we get both. This is a scent game. So I start with scent. I do the scent wire, and it was in that other video. Now, I'm going to do that about three times. Two days, skip a day, and do it again a day. And then I'm not going to do it again until next week or until I catch a live coon, a fresh one. I want an adult coon with sexual identification markers. Okay. I'm going to do that probably six times in total. That's it. Um, you don't have to do anything except for make sure you always have a high quality pay treat. That's the key with good quality coon scent. Never use the scent unless you're using a paid treat. We need the adrenaline to connect the two, okay? Now, after that's done, our dog, our hound, wants a coon. This is how wolves do it. Now, we're at that stage. Now, what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to blend some sight, okay? What I'm going to do is, is I'm going to do what I call genetic sight chase. Now, this is just wild predatory instinct, and what this is going to do is it's going to mimic how coyotes teach their young. It just simply, simply mimics a puppy that's been following their mom and has the game. And then when it gets up there to get a bite, it she takes off and she'll run way ahead of them and get up there and eat some. And then there comes the puppies. Every time she gets there, what she do? Well, she just takes off so she can eat. We have to understand though, guys, that these things are how she trains them as well. Everything a dog knows and does is what we use to train. This is their language, okay? It all equates to the same, but our young puppies don't go through this. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to set me up a tree, and I'm going to show my young dog a coon, okay? But I'm going to first make sure I'm not causing the problems other people do, okay? So the biggest trend is, is our young dog stays out there till it gets a little gamey. Our buddy calls us and it's time to go to the woods because he caught a coon. So we take that young dog that's never been to the woods before. We take it out to the woods and we get that coon out. We drag a track and we hide it up a tree. And then we let them pups out. And one's usually bold. Or maybe he saw the coon a couple times before and he's getting on it. You know, your friend ain't going to want to show off until his is looking good, okay? Now, I'm standing there, and my puppy won't bark, won't do nothing. So, you know what we're thinking? We're thinking, well, we got a dud. And it is embarrassing. But here's the thing. It does not matter if he barks at it. Makes no difference. But what we do, and what I used to do is, if they won't go on it, we'll kick that cage to them. We'll kick it to them. We'll scare them of it. If they don't go, we scare them of it more. We get a fear strike. So now they're barking at it good. The hairs on the back of our neck goes up and we're smiling because they're being aggressive on it. Yeah. No. Now the first reaction with that puppy was fear. Yes. Dogs do need to fear the game they pursue, but not at first. At first, in the wild, mommy would be there. They would have a security, okay? They would be tracking it first with her. They're slower than her. They're behind her, okay? 
So what we're going to do is we're going to mimic this. Rather than scare my puppy of a coon ever, I'm never going to do that because the puppies that are started that way, 90% of them, not all, because some are very bold or very outgoing, but 90% of them, when you go cut them in the woods the first time, if they've been scared of it first, as soon as they smell it in the woods, they go run the other way. They just go the other way. Now, they might go out deep, do this and that, but they, 90% of them don't track anything because they were scared of it. They didn't want it. So what I do is, is I do something that's magical. It's powerful. It's want Marion. It's the foundation of what I do. I'm going to show my dogs a young, a cage coon, but I'm going to wait till maybe they're a little gamey on a cat or they're a little older. They're showing me some confidence, but I'm not going to scare them of it ever. Now I've already scent wired. So they already want that scent deep within them. Okay. They can't resist. I rehabilitate dogs of all ages. I've rehabilitated pups that pee themselves if they see a hide to complete tree dogs, the boss man, literally. Um, when he left here, he was the boss man, not just the boss because he was a tree dog. That dog, when he seed a hide, he peed himself. He was scared to death of it at first. So this will re this will save dogs by rewiring their mind because it's a predatory instinct they can't resist. Okay. So scent wiring is huge. That gets up the first step. Everything I do gets the next step to come. So this way I can look into what's going on. I can get information and the dog already understands part of what I'm going to do next. Okay. And this is how we teach toddlers one step at a time. Okay. Now, I'm simply, instead of scaring my dog of a coon, I'm not going to because when we went to that woods that the dog's never been to before, he's like Spider-Man. He's just like a deer. He's studying that environment. He wants to know every piece of it. So they're distracted. They're not confident. They've never been there before. So I'm going to eliminate this problem too. Literally, while I'm starting my pups, I'm going to take them on three, four field trips. That's about all you need. They're right in the middle of the day. But what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to use a tree like a needle. So I'm going to take my pup out and I'm going to hook him up to a tree where I'm going to show him a coon. And I'm not going to do nothing. I'm just going to leave him there and let him explore. Let him get used to this area. Let him get desensitized to the environment. So anything else I'm doing in the future, his attention will be on rather than the insecurity of the environment. So I'm going to desensitize him to that exact spot, that tree where I'm going to show it to him. I'm going to put him out there and I'm going to go out there three, four times, hook him to the tree and let him just get bored. Let him be there for 10, 15, 20 minutes. Always so supervised. Don't talk to him. Just let him get bored of that spot. Now, when we do go to show him a cage goon, He's bored to death of that spot and he's comfortable. He knows nothing's coming in. He's, he's used to it, okay? He's desensitized. He could care less that he's in that environment. This is huge. Now, what we're going to do here is we're going to use the leash as a tool. I don't use the leash as a luggage rack, guys. I use it to train, okay? It's one of the most powerful training tools on the face of the earth and with a pinch chain and a leash i don't need anything else other than a long rope and a lean meat treat for a little while okay that's it a harness if i need to pull a dogs other than that i don't need nothing because i go to verbal control so there's no need for anything else okay it, it it's more getting results with dogs is more about wisdom than devices Absolutely. Now, I'm going to take that tree. I'm going to hook my pup up and I'm going to let him be there for 15, 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, just bored to death before I show him a coon. Now, what I'm going to do, guys, is I'm going to use the tree and the leash as an indicator switch. Just, or Yeah, just like a, a needle, a gauge. Okay. So this way, 
I can see into my pup when I'm starting young. Now, here's the key. I'm never going to take the coon to the dog. I'm just going to go past him. All right? So my dog is hooked up to a tree. He's bored. Okay? Nothing's going on there. He's desensitized to it. Now, I'm going to show him a coon. But what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to be like 15 yards away. And I am just going to, here's, here's my dog on a tree. Okay. Now I'm just going to come past him and I'm going to go fast. But then right, let's see if I can do it this way. Right when I get parallel to him, I'm going to pull the cage away from him a little bit. Okay. Dogs see way more in detail than us. So six inches is like three feet to them. Okay. So right when I'm getting as close to that dog, I widen the gap and then continue. Now his attention's on what I'm doing, okay? Now I'm going to come, turn around, come right back by, right? When I'm getting as close, I'm going to widen the gap. So as soon as it's getting close, instead of him getting intimidated, it's actually went away like cat and mouse, okay? So it's like cat and mouse, just a little bit. Now all I got to do is watch the leash. If the leash is slacked, he doesn't want it enough. I'm not going to come closer. If that leash is tight, just like a gauge, I know he's wanting it. Whether he's barking, whether he's standing there, what, what, no matter what he's doing, all I got to do is watch that leash. Now, if he's really intimidated, he's just simply going to be on the other side of the tree or the leash is going to be greatly slacked. Now, what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to come back by. As soon as I get close, I'm going to widen the gap. I'm going to keep an eye on that leash. Okay. So while I'm watching that leash, if that puppy's coming out to the end of it, tightening it up, I know to continue. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to go a foot closer. Depending on how the dog's acting, I might go a little closer, but a little bit closer. I'm not going to pull the cage to him. I'm going to go right back parallel across. And as soon as I get there, widen the gap. And then like that again, watch him. If he's wanting it more, come closer. Widen the gap. Okay. As you get closer, he'll light up and start barking and going on it. Then we know he's old enough to start. If not, he'll be at the other end, but he's never been directly scared of it. So we know not to go closer. Now, if they go farther away, we go farther away. If the gap, we widen the gap. So what you do is if that dog's over here and he's too young, don't matter how old he is, it's how old he developed. Okay. But what we do is is if he's all slacked and he don't want it, then we do go past one more time. But we go back a foot or farther to over, away from him before we go back. And we just do it once and put it away, okay? Now we're going to stop and we always take the dog away from the coon. Never the coon away from the dog. This stops, uh, stops the dog from losing attention in it. We never want our dog to lose attention if we're working on a coon. If they get a drink or do something, you're standing there talking to our buddies, or I am, he's lost attention in it. This is stay put on a tree. If they teach themselves to lose attention in it, they're not going to stay treed because staying treed is re-exciting their selves on a tree. So when they get bored because we're not there, they get down and either leave or they re-excite themselves, confirm that sense there and start treeing again. Okay. So if we're ever working on a cage coon, if we always take the dog away from the coon and put them up, we get a way better result because we're always leaving them wanting it more. And while they're sitting there in the kennel or the dog box, they're building the want to re-excite themselves, which is stay intrigued for a long time. Okay. Now, if that pup doesn't want to start, and we give it some time. We don't just leave it in the kennel. We get it out. We play with it. A dog starts faster, dependent on the experience it has in its life. Okay? But that doesn't mean it just has to be hunted. We can let it play in the yard. We can spend some time with it. The more you do with your dog, the better it's going to know you, the better it's going to hunt for you. But experience Exposure gets experience, okay? So if we just say, okay, we're going to let this young dog that didn't want to bark at a coon set in a pen, when we get it out, we just get out a bigger, same problem. Experience gets maturity. 
So in that case, then I take my dog to the woods and just go out and hunt. And then I'll wait before I'm ever going to show him a coon again. He doesn't need to see it to tree it. Okay. But I like speed training. So now let's say that our dog started barking at that coon in like three, four minutes because we've never scared him of it. We've scent wired him. So now that dog's going to be at the end of the tree. He's, if we follow these things, scent wiring and desensitizing him to the spot we're going to show him, he's going to want it. Now we're not, we're going by it. We're widening the gap. Every time we widen the gap, it's getting away. So now what happens is, is your part puppy starts cranking on that thing in a matter of two, three minutes, maybe five minutes. He's never been scared. We've set in the steps. Okay. Now what we're going to do is, is we're going to work closer. So I'm going to not bring it to him, but I'm just going to keep working my way closer and closer. So that way when I'm, when I'm coming past, okay, when I'm coming past that tree, he's barking at it, pulling on it. I widen the gap. Next time I come closer, but I'm still not taking it to him. I'm taking it past him. Now these is set up this because he don't even think he's going to get it when it comes past. So he's going to bark harder. And then when he, when he, he's really cranking on it, then I'm going to use a helper and do a genetic sight chase. Now he wants it. He's chasing it. Okay. I've set that up. But now what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to do another little step. I'm going to use that leash as a training tool again. Okay. I'm going to use reverse psychology. And I'm going to use that leash to take the place of mommy as confidence building. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use the leash tension. And anytime my pup doesn't want to go to the cage, I'm going to apply more tension. So he simply thinks he can never get to it. Now, this is substituting wild predatory instincts. When mommy took off with that coon and he couldn't get it when he did get there, even if it was still fighting her, he had the confidence of her. Okay. I'm going to use the leash tension to replace that. Now, I'm going to give you guys an example. So that way you can understand it. Do you guys remember when somebody offended you in our younger age? And I mean, they just made you mad, red in the face. And you're arguing with them and just arguing with them. But you're right there. You're holding yourself back. As soon as your buddy goes to stop you, what do you do? You go all out. Because he's stopping you, that gives you the confidence to get on it, to do it to it. This is the same thing with mommy being there. So I'm going to use that leash tension in the exact same manner. This is huge. Genetic sight chase literally builds want. With genetic sight chase, I put to one of three Grand Knight champions in my five, six, seven-month-old pups, or whenever it's time for that individual pup. A year old, whenever it's time for him, then I'm going to do genetic sight chase. Every dog I own goes through it because you, you're you always adding depth and drive. Okay? No dog trees hard enough, no dog hunts hard enough for me or should anybody because we can always make it better. This is what we do every night in the woods. But we can improve these things and get them done in our puppies right in their backyard, just lickety split. Okay? And then next week, I'll tell you guys how I do this to where I'm looking into my pups and seeing what they're going to have, what they're going to have bred into them. Okay. But this genetic sight chase, I have a helper take off with a coon. He's dragging it. I'm holding my puppy. My puppy may not even want to follow it. Okay. If he was barking at it on a tree case, one, they may not even want it. It doesn't matter. It's cat and mouse. They take off. You start going behind it. The puppy will start following behind it because of the movement of it. Okay. We go in a straight line if we can. We only go in a straight line. So that way the coon is never coming to the puppy. I'm always holding tension on that leash while the dog is going. As he starts to go fast, my helper is going to stop abruptly. As soon as they stop, I'm going to apply more tension. Okay. As soon as I apply the tension, my puppy thinks he can't get it, so he'll go more. As soon as he starts to go more, my helper takes off with the cage, dragging it, okay? Then we go. 
Now we're going to go in a straight line and get that young dog's heart rate up, just like they'd have been chasing mommy. We're going to get that heart rate up because as you get a heart rate up, the adrenaline starts flowing. It's a force, cause, and reaction. This is how it happens in the wild. So as we go in a straight line and that dog's running, his heart rate's coming up. Now he's never been able to get to this coon. It's never came to him. We're holding him back. He wants it. We're holding back. Okay. I will say, good boy, get it, find it, and set in some words or just praise the dog, however it is, when he does better. And then we're just going to keep doing it on a straight line. Now, here's what happens. Every time he stops, if you apply the right amount of tension, the gap will shrink. So if that young dog has confidence, when he's pulling the first time and stops, you apply the tension, right? And then he'll start barking at it, start wanting it, start trying to get it. It's that far away. They've been following it. Their heart rate's up. They can't get it. Then they take off again. As soon as they take off, you let the dog go, but use tension, okay? Now, when they're taking off, they're going to go again. Now, this dog's fighting harder, pulling more. When he abruptly stops, your puppy will be way closer to it. That's how we measure progress. Everything I do has to show me a result. What will happen is every time you stop, fast, I'm talking, I'll take a puppy that don't want a coon and and get that dog to eat through the cage in less than 15 minutes. This is so, and I invented this so everybody can see the results they want to see and they can see them faster and they can look inside their dog. Now you just go again. When you go again, I'll use this for tension. <laughs> okay. You go again and then that puppy's pulling, dragging, fighting you to get there. Okay. Now, literally as soon as he stops, he'll be that close barking at it. You go again, but you never let him up there. Never. Only a little bit closer. And every time he stops, you apply leash tension. Every time. If he ain't wanting as much, pull him back just a little bit. And every time you do this, he'll get closer, closer, because he's got confidence, 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 just like his mother was there. All the way to where he'll eat right through the cage to get at it. Okay? I recorded this many times, and they'll come out in our next productions. And you'll see all of this happen in less than six minutes. Now, we've got that genetic chase and they want it and they're confident over it, okay? Now I know they want it, they're sent wired. Now I'm gonna add another step, which you guys are gonna enjoy because all this is way easier than I think most people would imagine, okay? And then, and then you can use this for all sorts of other things, all right? Now, you know how I was using that pay treat and scent wiring? Remember how I was telling you I use that to set stuff up? Okay. Everything I do is for more reasons. This way, I'm never wasting my time. I'm always maximizing the results I'm getting with way less time. Okay. Life's short. It's way too short for me. Okay. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to do a thing that some people make fun of me. They tease. I don't care. All I care about is the result, okay? This is powerful and it works. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that pay tree and I'm going to take high quality coon scent and I'm going to teach the dog number two, okay? I fully believe the best dog in the world does just three things. One, they find it. Two, they tell you it's there. Three, they, they stay. So I work towards those things in that order then for accuracy, then everything else. But I'm getting them all done, or the majority of this done, right while they're pups, okay? Now, what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to take that pay treat, and I'm going to take coon scent, and I'm going to put me a little pile of pay treats, and I'm going to put a good amount of coon scent, and then I'm going to drag my trail. As I drag the trail, I'm going to pick that pay treat that I know that puppy wants like crazy because I've already set it up. And I'm going to put it along it. More at first, less as we go. But I'm going to freshen the scent up as I go. So we have less treats as the trail goes along and more scent as the, tra as the treat gets to it. So freshen your, your drag, your scent bag. You need to freshen it as we go. This is the reason why so many pups track track run tracks backwards at first. We spray our scent on our drag, heavy, 
and then we drag it. So the trail we're laying is actually backwards. It's actually more sent first, and then it gets weaker. This is literally teaches our dogs to backtrack. So always freshen your drags on the way to the tree. Now, as you're freshening your drag, lay some treats along there. Thin it out so there's less treats on the way. You can do this with any age pup. So you can do any of those things I was telling you first, but I like to do scent wiring first. That's the key. Okay. And then for scent wiring, you can go to eight week old pup and do trail. It's the same thing. He already understands these things. He would be learning this in the wild before eight weeks old. It's it, it oh boy, most wild dogs are going to be weaned at four weeks old. Um, um, not fully, but they'll be eating other foods a lot younger than other dogs. And it depends on the environmental condition, how fast they wean, how much food does mommy have, how much milk can she make, okay? We're just putting all these things right into our domesticated hounds. Now, I'm going to take that puppy out, and I'm just going to tell him, find it. That's my keyword. Always setting stuff up. I'm going to say, find it. And I'm going to tap my finger and let him get that pay treat. We already know he wants the pay treat. We already set it up. Now, we already know he wants the coon scent. We already set it up. So now scent wire, and we'll get him tracking. So literally, he's going to track that to the tree. But if he doesn't, just tap your finger and get him finding them. If it's a real young puppy. So this way he learns to, he gets a reward, a most wanted reward for following that scent. Okay. Now it's bred straight in them. So they get it really quick. Now, what I'm going to do is, is at the tree, I'm always going to end my track at the tree. I'm going to take those lean meat treats, and this might sound funny, but I'm going to put them in the bark. And I'm going to put a little trail of them going up the tree. And then however tall my puppy is on his hind legs, I'm going to put a ring around the tree of lean meat pay treats that that individual dog goes crazy for. And I'm going to put them just to where he's got to stretch up to get them. Now, as soon as that puppy gets to the tree, 90% of them don't even check it because their world is on the ground. So as soon as he gets to that tree, I'm going to do the same thing I did in the thing. I'm going to tap it. I'm going to let him see that that treat's up there. He'll get one. Then he's going to get up and get another one. Then he's going to see that ring and he's going to get up there to get him. And I'm going to tell him my tree word. Coon got it or get on that tree, whatever word we use. I'm going to use that word. The excitement for that is winding him up, okay? That adrenaline for the pay tree is making this a permanent impression in a little, little pup. Now, I'm also doing way more, okay? Remember how I told you I look into everything? Well, I'm going to use those treats in the bark for another tool. I'm going to use them to check to see if my young pup likes to chew or not. Mm -hmm. I don't like dead trees. We plant a lot of them. It ain't nothing worse than have a 150-year-old tree stripped of bark all the way around it. It's dead. Uh, this is a major offense in my family. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to check for chewing and I'm going to do chewing prevention. As I don't have to do anything else. As my puppy gets those treats out of the bark, at first he'll start getting bark. Then as he's getting bark, he'll start using his tooth just to get that meat out of the bark, out of the crack of the tree. Then all of a sudden you'll watch and he'll start licking the treats out of the tree. Literally, if you got a chewer, this will never happen. They just eat the bark in the tree. That's a genetic chewer. Now we know. Now we, the other puppies are learning that the tree is nothing to bite. It's nothing to even put their teeth on. So they're literally learning at first never to touch the tree with their teeth themselves. And that's how you break stuff all the way to do it. So it's amazing. Okay. Now your young dog knows. Number one, find it. Now give him your command words. Talk to it. Talk to it. We're getting barking or whining up it. He's starting to learn or learning number two. Okay. Now we've got find it. We've we've got tell us it's there. As soon as you put it up the tree, if you've done a genetic sight chase, he's going to tell you it's there. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to add a little bit of that stay put 101 as soon as they go up the tree. 
Okay. So right there at the end of the genetic site chase, that cage goes right up the tree. I'm going to pull it high because I don't want jacking or anything. I can always lower it to each individual dog. We don't want no problems, only results. So that's what we're going to get. Now, I'm going to go back to that leash tension. As soon as that cage goes up and my dog's barking at it at the tree, a lot of times they don't want to just get on the wood. So regardless, I'm not going to let them. I'm going to use the leash to train. When that young dog gets up to the tree and he's barking at it, okay, I'm going to apply leash tension, just like you would your fishing pole string to tell if you got a bite. Just apply a little tension and stop him from getting up on a tree, just like we did the genetic sight chase. Now, once, okay, once he's barking at it hard and for 30 seconds to a minute or so, he hasn't been able to get there and his tension on that leash has increased to where he's pulling, you know, he wants to get on the tree. Pop it. Just let it loose. And literally, they'll pop right up on the tree and do it right. So you can use that leash tension as a confidence builder for everything and the dog understands it. Resist. It's there. It's holding back. They want it. So this is all reverse psychology. It's all want Marion because we've never disciplined the dog. He's always wanted it. And what we've done is we've used scent first, then sight, then scent back for the track, then sight. So we're blending the belief between their eyes, which most always believe more. Everything's more visual, okay, learners. But we're blending the sight belief with their scent. So we're getting the best of both worlds. This is pre-accuracy, all of it. So all this stuff that I'm doing still gets 30 more other things. It's just hard to explain all the things that it gets. Those will be in, that will all be in my written stuff where I go through this and it's videoed and I actually show it being done. And we're working on that now, guys. But um, just those things right there. And you may have to watch the video. Watch the video again when you go to do it, okay? The common trend is most people show their dogs a cage game. Many people don't, okay? It's all right if we do that part of it right. Just remember, they never need to see one to tree one. So just hunting is always better experience if we've scent wired first. But blending the two always gets a better result. This is why most people do it. But if we know the little tiny rules that dogs understand in doing it, we get the best of both worlds, period. OK, this method and I'm going to teach you drifting back the other half of stay put 101. This method of puppy starting builds pure confidence and teaches any young dog. OK, the whole entire game before they ever have to do it, just like our kids go to kindergarten before first grade and then second grade and third on through their education. This is exactly how my system works. But what I'm doing is, is I'm taking as little time as possible and having as most fun as possible because I'm not disciplining my pup. If he's dragging me trying to get back to the tree, I'm going to praise him. That's a good thing. Okay. So it's just pure enjoyment for me and the dog. This is straight up what Mary. But what we're doing is, is we're giving our young dog experience because we're controlling it. We're looking into what he is while he's raw and wriggling, and he hasn't learned how to make any mistakes yet. That's when we can tell the most information about our pups. And that's when it's most important to get out there and spend time with them. Every dog is most impressionable or easily, easily is trained between the ages of six months old and a year and a half. What we train in that time frame is always more permanent, always last the longest with every dog, every breed of dog, because they developed into it. If they developed into it, that means they've sunk it into mental memory and muscle memory. What sunk into both is always the most consistent. That's why I use mental memory and physical memory. So this way you can train any dog doing it both. Um, you can set a weak trait into physical memory, all the way to an auto response. So I get auto response to where like for PKC and your 
big UKC money hunts I'm going to get into, um, I train my dogs to back up and sit down. So by themselves, I take all my pictures, video, whatever I want. But as soon as any other dog comes in, they just back up and plant it. If the dog's trying to eat them, they'll just move around a tree. If the dog bites them, they'll just tree harder. Um, this is for the, I call it high tree pressure. And yeah, I do every aspect of the sport, guys. I don't know if I'll live long enough to write it all down, but I'm trying, okay? Um, and this is why I'm doing these videos, so that way this stuff doesn't get lost. And then all this stuff, guys, use it. Use it all you want. Have fun with it. It works absolutely the fastest way. I call it speed training. Um, it gets extreme results. And, and, and we're getting as many of these things out here as we can. So this way, everybody can start having fun with this stuff as I'm getting the finer details of the production deal. But it's all easy. It all makes common sense. Um, now I'll go over those common sense things in a whole nother thing. And the fail safes that we put in. Anything, when, if <clears throat> I, I use a cage coon as limited as possible, but I use one, okay? But I break a rule. The traditional rule is once a dog can tree a cage coon, we never show it again. Okay. That's a dang good rule, but it's wrong. Okay. Now, there's many reasons why we say this, and experience is number one. They got to figure out how to do it themselves. So I still observe that rule. I just break it a little bit. What I'm going to do is, is I'm going to do what most people do. I'm going to show my young dog a cage coon or a scented cage and and we're we're going to show it and get these results we want but we're not going to use it no more than we need to okay so as soon as my young dog's treeing good on that cage coon and the thing boom it's done he isn't to see it no more that's it he don't need no more repetitions of it he knows his job okay now i'm going to reserve uh, observe one of the best rules that's ever been made. He doesn't need to see one again. Now, I might release one to him depending on the environments, the conditions or whatnot, but I ceased and desist all cage coon work. He doesn't need no more. Now we go out and we just hunt and we hunt and we got to hunt lots of nights. I try not to just make one dump. Try not to make just two dumps because our dogs actually start learning way more on the third and fourth dump of the night. OK, it's just like an athlete. You got to get warmed up before you can perform. This is because their hormones got to get flowing. All right. This is the difference between a young dog and a seasoned dog. A, uh, a seasoned dog, as soon as he hits the hunt triggers, all those hormones that he has to create to process hormones so he can track start flowing. A young dog has to get into that mode. So it's very important to make more dumps with a younger dog, but always end on the best note. So as soon as they do an outstanding job when they're young, I end, I stop. That's it. We end it on that note. They get put up. I got plenty of time to hunt this young dog. He doesn't need to be jammed, but I'm going to hunt him that night until either I get a good one or at least three or four drops, even if nothing's running. Okay. Now we're in the woods hunting. Our young dog knows the game. Here's what's happened, guys. Our dog was never scared of it. He was never scared of the environment he was in around it. He simply wanted it more. We barely even talked. He himself wants it more. Now, I use a little key and I don't discipline my dogs before we go to the woods when they're young. So I don't train them to load up. I don't want them getting distraught for any reason because this is the same as death. If we go out here and try to train our dog to load like I used to all the time, right before we go to the woods, and then he's making me mad. So I'm getting mad and he's getting his legs banged in. He's not in a state of mind to hunt. He's distraught. When we're distraught, we're not very creative. Okay. So what I'm going to do is if I have to, and I haven't taught my young dog to load up, I'm literally just going to pick him up, put him in there. Now he's never been scolded. He's never been whooped. He's just always wanting it. And he's in that adrenaline mode, too much energy, ready to go. Raw and wriggling. That's what we need. Okay. Now what we're going to do is, is, is let him go. Just cast him and hunt him. He, he's ready to go. We've got all these other things set up. 
He knows his job. He wants the scent, he wants the coon, and he wants the tree. And more importantly, he knows exactly what we want. It usually takes me about Boy, if I would say two weeks, it usually doesn't take that long. Just depends on each individual dog. But what I will say is, is absolutely just about every dog I start this way will start split treeing their own coon in under a month. Now, if you've got some really good blood and you start them this way, Generally, however long the yard work takes, could take a week, could take two, could take three, but I get those results in the yard. Whenever you get those results in the yard, it generally, as long as you've took the dog on three or four field trips, it's only going to take three or four nights for that young dog to treat his first coon by himself in the woods. Now think about it. He knows the entire game and he wants everything we want. So now, within the first week of your young dog being in a coon, he's hooking up right because he had the experience to do so. <laughs> he believes his eyes and he believes his nose. This gets him to stay longer. So now your young dog will treat for 30 minutes instead of five or four. So we don't got to run as fast. Everything should get progress. Everything we do should make way more progress. And that's what I do. Now, when you guys do this, and the guys that I teach you do this, that's the results we get. <laughs> this is why they push me to write these books and stuff. And I absolutely am learning how to write and stuff, and we'll get her done. But um, that's how it works. Experience begets world champions. We all know how much hunting it takes, and it takes that much hunting. I'm not taking out from that. I'm doing more of it usually because of that third and fourth drop. But I'm always in and on a good note, and my young dog knows the game, and he performs the game consistently. And next week, I'll tell you guys all the information you get out of starting them that way, so that way you know if your young dog's worth breeding. Um, and every dog is different, but it allows us to see into each individual hound extensively. So we can tell the faults. Now, any, and I'll get into that next week, but literally while I'm starting this way, I'm looking for bad behaviors. If they do do it, I can correct it instantly right then before it becomes a problem in the woods. But if it's a problem that I don't want, like it is genetic aggressive or it is shy aggressive, I'm not wasting another minute. None. Waste no time. I already know. So now I'm not feeding a dog for two years. I'm not vetting it, shotting it, doing all this. I know the dog is not going to work for anybody because there is a genetic issue um, or, or the dog doesn't have a nose or for whatever reason, we know. Plus, there's a whole world of health information we get too right while we're doing this stuff. And I'm going to go over a whole bunch of that next week, guys. Um, now, I want to put in here... The next thing I do when my young dog trees for the first time in the woods, this is huge. This is like, we'll call this stay put 102. Yeah, that's what it is. Stay put 101 is a control tree. Stay put 102 is the thing. Having a little bit of a bad day, guys, so I apologize. Never get electrocuted. Nah. It took me 20 years just to get back to, to where I am now. Okay, now this one is very important and you can do this with any dog that you're having stay put problems in the woods with any dog. Matter of fact, I do it with every dog, every dog. I don't care if it's Grand Knight Champion, I'm gonna test it so I know. If I don't know, the dog's gonna stay, I can't call it in a tree. With my, I like the first tree dogs, they better be consistently first tree, okay? But when my dog trees, I'm going to put it on the paper because when my dog trees, he's never going to leave ever. If a herd of cattle comes in, they'll kill him there. He'll die there, but he won't leave. Now, hopefully that never happens. Okay. 
But stay puts my pet peeve because it takes me so long to get to trees. I've lost so many hunts, and all the local guys know this, hunt after hunt after hunt because I get back to the club late. I think I won the Bob Miller Memorial Hunt. I know two years in a row, and I think that, yeah, we got the trophy for the third year. Uh, but the first two years, I won it. I got, I cost a hunt. It took me so long to walk at 330 pounds that I get back to the club late. Blue tick days, this and that and everything else. So I'm not competition hunting until I can do my dogs justice. And that's what I'm working on now. But with hunting like that and having to hunt like that, I had to come up with different ways to get stay put. Okay. And I don't make nothing. It's got to be bred in. But what I do is, is I do what wild predatory instincts for game because our pups miss out on these. Okay. Now this is a big one. I call it stay put 102 and it's drifting back. All right. Now what we're going to do is, is our young dog gets treed and he gets hooked up. Now he's already been at the tree with me. So that stay put 101 I did right when I, he first started treeing eliminates coming to me, greeting, eliminates leaving the tree eliminates all that stuff and they're going to tree way harder. So I've set that up It's just briefly, no longer than it takes. Boom, 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 right up the tree. Maybe two days of it just depends on the dog, what your dog needs. So he's doing it right in front of you. Okay. Now, as soon as that happens, when he runs a hot track, he's going to tree good. Now I still observe getting in there with my pups as quick as I can, especially if I go as quick as I can, because it takes me longer to get there. Now, I try to stay close and not disturb them. Once they get treed, as soon as they get there, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to tell them the exact same thing that I told them at the control tree in my backyard. Okay. I'm going to tell them, good girl, get on that tree. I'm not going to say coon got it because I don't know if it's there yet. Oh, my gosh, guys, you're going to love this. Okay. All right. Now. My young dog's made his first tree, right? And stay puts my pet peeve. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get in there. Good girl, you got it. I'm going to crank her up and let her know I'm happy. Good girl, get on that tree. Talk to it. Talk to it. Okay. I'm going to praise her up, let her know I'm there. And then I'm going to back up and drift away. So I'm going to turn around, start walking, turn my light out. After I get about five, 10 yards, depending on the dog, I'm going to keep turn the light out and keep walking. And then I'm going to just make some footprint sounds. Okay. So that way it sounds like I'm drifting away. I've left. Now I'm going to turn around. I'm going to watch my dog. Now, mind you, I've never put a leash on my young dog. This is huge. This is huge. I've never put a leash on my young dog. Okay. What I'm going to do is, is I'm going to use the verbal cues that I've already used in the woods. And the one, Marion sets it up. I'm going to stand there and shut up. I'm not going to say a word. I'm just going to watch. And I'm going to sit there however long it takes for my dog to get off that tree and lose excitement in that tree. I'm going to wait it out. If it's five minutes, if it's 30 minutes, I'm going to wait it out so I know. And I can use this information in confidence. Now, as soon as my dog gets off that tree, and I'm going to wait out until they do, I'm going to scold it. Ah, get on that tree. When they get back up on a tree, I'm going to walk in and praise them up. Good girl, get on that tree. And I'm going to praise them up and get them treating really hard again. But then I'm going to walk back and drift away in a different direction away from the tree. So I'm going to literally do the same thing. Walk away, turn my light off, keep making some footprints, turn around, walk my, watch my dog. And wait her out or him. I'm going to wait them out until they get off that tree again. As soon as their nose touches the ground, ah, get on that tree. Pause. And then your positive reinforcement words. If we just discipline a dog on a tree, we're always disciplining it. We always have to. If the dog wants to, we never have to say a word. So it's, ah, get on that tree. Then pause. Even if they're still going away from the tree, talk to it, talk to it. Get on that coon, coon got it. Whatever praise words I need to get her tree in. 
Once she's treeing good, I'm going to go in, praise her up. Good girl, you got it. Talk to it. And then I'm going to drift away again. I like to do everything in threes. I actually like to do everything in fours, but at least three times. This is to set it into muscle memory. First one, mental memory. Step two, repetition, mental muscle. Step three, is setting it into muscle memory with the repetition. So this way you're thoroughly getting the result or at least progress, okay? So I drift back and and a third time and turn my light out and wait, okay? If I have a buddy, I have them while I'm doing this, check the tree, all right? Now, the whole time I've been doing this, I've never used a leash. If we use a leash every time, after the dog is there for so long, there's always been a leash holding him there. This does not get real stay put. It does not because there's always a leash holding there. A real stay put dog won't leave because he won't leave himself. This is what I'm getting. Now, what I'm going to do is, is force myself to work on number three using a leash, I've had to watch my dog. So I haven't started looking for the coon. Yeah. I forced myself to work on stay put. Now, I still want to know if it's got it, but them first three drift backs, I'm literally working on stay put. My dog's never been on a leash. So it's forcing me to get the train that I need. And that forces me not to worry about accuracy until after stay put. Accuracy is easy. It's, it's so simple. Accuracy is easy. Um, it, it's, it, it's nothing. Uh, you can teach a cocker spaniel to be accurate. A coon hound, if you do just a few things with this scent nose belief, can be unimaginably accurate. It's real. There are dogs out there that never train unless they're under meat. I know. I've seen it. I train them. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is, is if I haven't had a buddy, okay, is then I'm going to leash my dog up to a tree after I've got that training done. And then I'm going to check the tree and then I can knock it out if I want. But I've already got the stay put training in. That will just solidify it. Now, if I have a helper, okay, if I have a helper, while I'm doing the stay put, I'm having him shine the tree. This just makes the dog want a tree more because of the light action up in there naturally. And if he finds the coon, when I scold my dog on that third time, I'm going to have him drop it, okay? I want to make sure my dog's not gun shy first. So I check that in the yard with my pups or whatnot. But what I'm going to do is, or use a CB, is wake that dog out that third time. As soon as she comes off that tree, ah, ah, get on that tree with discipline. Wait. Talk to it. Get on that tree. Get it, get it, get it. Get it, girl. Talk to it. And I praise to that dog's temperament. If I need to get boisterous, I do. Dogs smell the hormones that's on you. So I never train flat. I'm either, I'm always using some kind of a temperament myself. So I'm either extra excited or sulking. So this way they connect to this. Okay. That's, that's how dogs whisper. They literally smell what you feel. Dog has the ability to process your scent glands before you know. They can tell you're mad before you know you're mad if the dog cares to, okay? When they're in adrenaline mode, they don't care. They're in adrenaline mode. But what I'll do is, is have my friend drop that out right when she's going back the third time. This is just extra solidification that if she's leaving, it was coming out. And Literally, we've got the bugs done all to begin with. There's no problems. Now, every night that young dog's in the woods, we're seeing progress because of the experience they had. So we're happy. We want to spend more time with it if it's doing good. We feed it better. We take care of it better if it provides us enjoyment. So that's why I do these things, guys, to improve every, every single coon dog that's out there. Everything I do, I'll take Grand Night Champions through it. If they lack in this or that, it'll improve any aged dog and anything you need. 
Um, and then I take all this stuff, this one, Marion stuff, this one on ones is just the foundation of how I do things where I'm not disciplining dogs and I get them to do what I want to do. And then, though, when it comes time for discipline, I discipline harder than anybody I've ever met because I do it differently. Okay. So I don't put up with the problems everybody else has. I do three steps in the backyard to get me a whole different dog. But at the same time, at any moment, I'm not going to use a switch. I'm not going to use a leash. I'm not going to kick my dog. I'm not going to break a rib. I'm not going to take any hunt out. I'm simply going to use a pinch chain. So I don't discipline in anger. Now, some people don't understand this. I discipline. But if I discipline just because I'm mad, that's misplaced aggression. That is the same things for tree aggression, chewing, jack in the tree, and off game breaking. Off game. It's all misplaced aggression. Okay. They're adrenalinic. They're getting on it. They're doing it to it. And then something else encounters it. The aggression that they're throwing here directs over here. That's misplaced aggression. When we discipline when we're angry, okay, that's misplaced aggression. Now, yes, we got to discipline. And we can, but I just exercise one rule. I have patience first. So if it's something that I have to stop now, I discipline right then. That's not angry. That's just out of necessity, okay? My dogs are not getting hurt. But if it's anything I can address, like a little fault or something, okay, that doesn't need immediate attention, I just step back and think first. Hook my dog up to a tree or off to the side. The more I'm angry, the more I wait. And I think you would not imagine what 30 seconds to a minute gives you in thought when you're angry. When we're angry, we can't learn. When we're angry, we can't think. We're not in any state of mind. 30 minutes of just taking a break, even though your dog's jacking a tree. It ain't going to hurt nothing. We're going to break that dog. Yeah. Step by step. Easily. But instead of just whooping that dog, force patience. Hook it up. Put a pinch chain on it. Use the pinch chain to discipline the dog. You won't take hunt out because that's how mommy disciplined the dog when she was weaning it. She didn't bite holes in the neck. She told him no by giving him a nip on the neck and it pinched his skin. So literally exercising patience by putting that pinch chain on and using the pinch chain to discipline is three times, oh my gosh, it's not, oh, I don't know how to compare this. It's like 100%. It's over 100% difference in the discipline you're doing because you don't got to keep doing it. You discipline your dog minds. It's over. It's done because that's how mommy did it. And that's the first thing of discipline they learn. So it's in every dog already. That's why I use a pinch chain. I'm not training my dog. Mommy did it for me. I'm using what they've already learned to train my dog the next steps. But I know that was a little scattered up, guys. I feel kind of bad about that. But I'm just having a rough day here today. My seizure medicine may be off a little bit. But no, the information's there. Okay. Now. This is what I do. Set wire, okay? Track to tree with treats. That's find it. Two, tell me it's there. Genetic sight chase, using that tree on the side, okay? Where we're never scaring a dog. And then as soon as he's barking at it, get him running behind it and using that leash tension. That way we're always building confidence. As soon as they're screaming at it, right up a tree. Hang it high so this way they don't jack at it. If the dog doesn't want to tree on it, you can lower it or have a buddy shake it or whatnot. Get them treeing it good, but don't just let them up on a tree. Have them tree for a while first. Maybe even their first whole session if they're tree in light. Just hold them back from it. Keep that leash tension. Use the leash tension as a training device. It is huge. Then once that dog's just like on a cage, this will teach it. On the cage, when you're letting up on the leash, it's the same on a tree. So when you let up on a tree, they'll pop right up on there. OK, and then let them tree. Do this thing. Work them on a tree like three times, three or four, right in the yard. And I like to do two days, skip a day and do a day. You can do it. Do consecutive days 
in a row when you get to that tree, at least like two in a row or three times the first day. Do a couple reps. A couple reps will allow you to see more into your dog. So you can see as they're developing this, then we're not going to show it to it anymore. We're going to get the woods, the dog in the woods. We're going to get it under a tree. And then we're going to do drift. It's been in the woods. He knows the game, all of it. The more we hunt, the longer we live. It's exceptional exercise. The better our dogs behave, the longer we get a hunt and the longer we get to live. I sample of this. If it wasn't for coon hunting, I wouldn't be alive. They call me the walking miracle at the hospital. I Chad our way to pay back what Brussel and my friends did for me. Yeah, and I'll tell a little story. He wasn't calling him every time he treed. So one night we lost on Friday night. I told him, Chad, has that dog ever left a tree that he's located on? Has he ever left any tree ever? No. I said, ever in his life? No. If he trees, where's the meat? It's in the tree every time. If he trees on a telephone pole, Chad, where's the coon? It's on the wire, Willie. I said, if he trees, what's he got? He's got the grease. I said, tomorrow night, call him on as soon as he cracks it. And that was it. <laughs> yeah. It's in your dog like this is absolutely astronomical. That's what I get. I get such consistency that my dogs were until I've knocked out 10 coon, 15 coon, or until they've treed that many coon. If I don't, can't knock them out because of population. Then we can discipline. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Chad went on to just do some amazing work with Brussels. And we become best friends because we train a lot alike. We don't like killing every coon. Our dogs need to treat it for ourselves. We're not beating dogs. Uh, my guys, Chad's a monster. If he wanted, whooping and scold our dog every time we get it out. That dog will be mediocre. But simply, every time this is going down, it will be in the woods. Later, after he's got the foundation under his legs. See? Okay, guys, um, that's what I wanted to go over today. I've got uh, just a couple minutes here for a couple questions on puppy starting. If any, um, I can get to the questions on YouTube. Let's see if I can bring this up. Oh, here's a good, absolutely, this is probably the most important thing that we need to do. Um, this is huge, especially with our coon hounds, because we breed them to want to hunt, okay? Now, I never call my young dogs off the track unless they're in danger for something, ever, because I want that depth, I want that drive. But when it comes to the end of the night, and our young dog doesn't want to stop, he's just getting ready for a a bruising. If we got to chase them down in this and that, we're going to be late to work. We start to get anxiety. Our night can turn into huh, a couple days looking for a dog. And then this way, I always know I can get my dog. Okay. Without having to scold it. Number one with come here is never whoop your dog when it gets to you. I don't care if it takes an hour to catch it to catch it when it does come to you if you whoop it it's after the fact not after the effect i say after the fact it's after the fact that the dog did not obey you so later when you catch it and you scold him his mind don't work like ours he don't even remember the only thing he'll remember in that case is is he got whooped for coming to you okay this is a want marion technique so if we're out there catching up our dogs and we're whooping them because we can't get them. Even once the dogs are smart, that dog won't come to you the next time. If it got a hard whooping, three times harder. Okay. Now, 
we're kind of lucky with our dogs because they tree. So we get a little bit laxed with this because once our dogs are doing good, we don't ever have to worry about it. We're always going to get them off a tree. Road, I take come here all like, oh, you're an idiot. <laughs> and I just stand there. You know, we're standing here for five minutes because the dogs are three quarters of a mile and a mile. I got Brussels and Basil twins all, all the way, complete obedience. And the longer we stand there, the longer these guys are thinking I'm a fool. And then instantly, you could hear them a bust in the brush, both of them, one at one side and one at the other. <laughs> at the same time, I didn't, that was just awesome. Um, that really was. Never said a word. These guys have never seen anything like that. I heard it does take a little bit more time for that level of come here. Uh, it's amazingly rewarding to show off with your dogs. Also, know guys, anybody who has a I obedience train my dogs so that way people can see the entire. This is an exceptional way to to bring a ten any dog. This whole sport's about showing off and feeling good about ourselves because of the results we get. Yeah. We'll get that recorded up too. And then um the woods. Hi Bruce. How's it going? Just answering a question here on come here. But I will say, a seasoned dog is an adrenalinic controlled dog. That's what a seasoned dog is. He's learned to control those hormones so he can process hormones, okay? I obedience train my dogs in the yard to get adrenaline control. So that way, when my dog's checking up a tree, he ain't just trained because a scent went up like other When my dog's checking up a tree, he ain't just trained because a scent went up like other dogs. He's a thinking. He's never getting to that excitement port. A, a excitement level that stops his ability to think clearly. That is accuracy. That is what every legend of accuracy does. They're simply thinking instead of treeing. Okay. Now, this first thing I do with come here is obedience. Okay. And, and I have to have come faster. Okay. You can actually watch this video on wildwilliesway.com. It's uh, pre-training. So the first step in my book is come here, but I use it for a couple of different things. The first step is to come here because most older dogs know come here. So it's a quicker way to get them to understand our training. And if it's a younger dog and it don't know come here, it needs to know it. Okay. So litter likes me. Okay, I've already fed this dog some pay treats. So I found a treat that this dog has to have. That's the key to every dog. This is how we can train every dog differently, yet doing it the same methods by changing their exceptionally good go to for hounds. Hot dogs sucked. I use them for 20 years and never found hunger training to where we never hold food from a dog to get that who's crazy for is how you get speed training income here. Now, we already know what treat. We've already got it. Little sandwich bag or whatnot. And you ain't even thinking about you. Okay. Now, we're going to use that pinch chain and that treat. Pinch chain equates to mommy's teeth. And the treat equivalates to mommy's milk. Instantly. Oh, fast. Oh, my. Oh, Jeff Tomlin. Life. It would come here long range, everything. Dennis and Luna. Pre because they cast him, he scored it, and he's like, thank you, guys, I'm going back to the club. Luna, come here, boop, okay? So there's many reasons why I do these tools, and it's all to get a better dog in the woods. But what we're going to do is we're going to distract. He's doing something, his name. This is come here. So you want to put the command word on the end of it. Name first, Brussels. Now, you just do it easy at first. We don't want to do it hard. This is powerful training. Otherwise, the dog will think it, don't, it can't never leave you. Okay? Stop right there. That's important. Okay? So as soon as that dog stops, you feed it a treat. If it doesn't want to treat because you pinched it, 
and shut it and let it taste it, okay? And it needs to be a pay tree. Then you walk away and do it again. So let the dog get his mind off. Russell, come here. Give him a pinch. Stop him as soon as he gets there. Give him that pay tree. Now, what I'm going to do is command word repetition. Since I got a pinch, and I'm pinching on come here, I also want him to know that come here is not a bad word. If I just pinch a dog on come here, come here, literally that dog's going to get scared to hear come here, and they'll get scared. That's why I'm using the name. Russell, come here. But now when the dog comes to you, repeat the command word. So, Russell, come here. Give that pinch. Okay. Wind him in. He come, it'll come run to you right there. Feed him the treat and then repeat the word. Good boy, come here and feed him a treat and feed him another one. Good boy, come here. Good boy, come here and feed him three or four treats and say the, this is how you get consistency. And it's making him, letting him know that the command word isn't a bad thing. He's not getting old. Russell, come here. Pinch on here. As soon as he gets there, good boy, come here. Good boy. Now he's learning and he's growing to want to do it. Now we just go do it again, okay? Now, after two or three times, you'll see that dog does not want to leave your side. It's that fast, okay? Now, the first day we do it, three sets or whatnot, okay? We're just going to pinch easy. Now, if you've got a really outgoing dog that's just not getting it all, go ahead and pinch harder. But you want them in the game first. You don't want to scare them of it at first. You just want them to, be, to, to know it's there and get them to respect it. Now, on the second day, I'm going to do it again, but I'm going to pinch him harder, okay? Not all the way hard. Usually on the third day, I'll make a statement, but I'm going to do the exact same thing again, pinch a little harder, feed him a treat, okay? Now, every night, though, at the end of this, this is what we need to do. I call it disconnect. We need to make sure that our young dog doesn't just stay by our feet when we go hunt. So we want come here, but we don't want stay. So this is how we do it. After we do our come here training, pinch the dog, it comes to you. You give it its treat. After you're done with your sessions, that dog's not going to want to leave your side. Okay. Because you have just taught him to come here and you're holding all the food. So we're going to use. Uh, oh. Uh, I can't recall. But a buddy of mine helped develop this one. And I give credit to where it's due every time. Michael Barnes, okay? We just make a ghost trail. So what we're going to do is, is after we've done our pre-training, okay, we let the dog off and let him go run around play. If that dog does not want to leave our side, that's okay. What we're going to do is we're going to add another little step. I do this after pre-training or come here every time. I just scatter some of those pay treats in the trail. I just scatter those pay treats in the trail and tell him find it and let him go eat. And I've taken the long rope and pinch chain off and let him spend time in my presence, but not being right beside me. So if you don't have a fenced in yard, use the long rope, but take the pinch chain off and just put it, this long rope on his collar. And then let him eat some treats or something so he's in your presence. Now, you have a dog that when you call, he'll come. If he doesn't do it in the woods, do more in the yard, and he will in the woods. Um, if you've got a really stubborn one, you can do it. So After you're done hunting and you've got depth and all this in, put your pinch chain on, your long rope on, and start walking out. When he ain't mine yet, do a, a come here section. Just like that with a treat. And then take him home. It's that easy. Just use a distraction so the dog doesn't want to come. Then tell him to come here. Use that pinch chain, timing of the name. And then you got come here. Now, later, guys, but this is one I'll have to write, okay? Um, that is uh, extremely effective come here. You don't never got to worry about going and getting your dog. And you just call your dog and it'll come, okay? Now, I do take this way farther to alternate come here. So that way, I just, my dogs come instantly, okay? But that there, what I do with that is shot collar marrying. So I use the pinch chain and a shot collar in combination together. So that way they truly understand and respect the shot collar. 
Shock collar sucks. They ruin more dogs than anything else in this world, especially coon hounds. They are not meant, shock collars are not training tools. They are long range reinforcement devices of already learned behaviors. Back in the day when shock collars come out, we used to get a video that explained this. You are literally, for real, supposed to train your dog what you want to use a shock collar on it for in your yard to give it an understanding of it. Then after the dog understands it with a training collar, pinch chain or choker chain, then you're supposed to use the shock collar to reinforce the behavior at long range. This, this is how it's supposed to work thoroughly, but it doesn't really work like that, okay? So even if you train your dog with a collar and then you go out and shock your dog, this is because it's AC current, it's pulsating. The tongs are sideways. There's only two of them. Okay. And it's AC current. So it doesn't feel natural. It's confusing. I know I was electrocuted. It's a pulsating current. They use that so they can make micro chips and small stuff. So DC current would provide just the solid. But here's what happens if you shock your dog, it feels this word this foreign thing to it. If it's being aggressive to something, even a possum, and you shock it, literally, it's going to take that form feeling out on whatever it's being aggressive to. This is why so many dogs get worse on training off game if the owner's been trying to break with the shock collar. Dogs do not understand it. Uh, even one of the smartest dogs I ever touched my own eclipse, double insane Wenty bread. It took me a week to shock collar Mary. Absolutely one of the smartest dogs. Absolutely. Even shot collar Marion did not understand it. It's that foreign. Now, if we turn our shot collars up and we and we put it up on high, it's even worse. It doesn't just give pain like we're thinking. Okay. Our mind works on electrical synapses. Every thought that we do to move that pinky, a sparks went off in my brain. Okay. This is why we're made of 75% water to carry the electrical synapses. Everything we do is electrical. If we're getting too much electricity, that back feeds into our brain. <laughs> Electrocution. Yeah, never get 480. Woo! Buddy, they smell burnt. I got burnt till they smelt me of smoking. I had 100, 150 penny mall seizures every dang week from it and grandma seizures. Now, I know that's exact ex extreme, but this is what's happening with the dogs. If that's up too high, they can't think because their mind is being overloaded with all this electrical signal. So it's like it's like a wave in a pool. After they've got the correction, that wave, that electricity is still messed up their mind. Their mind is still not in a condition to learn. Now, after we do this over and over and over, the dog will eventually get it. They'll eventually understand, hey, I can't do this. But all the times before then, with no understanding, that's torture. That is torturing a dog until it gets it. That's not right. Because it just takes hunt out of your dog. It literally just takes hunt out of your dog or gets them to treat or do whatever it is they're doing wrong more. Okay? It's just like negative attention. If you're whipping your dog at the tree and it ain't stopping, it's going to treat that off game more. Doesn't matter what it is. Doesn't matter if there's a deer in the tree. It sees the discipline as part of the excitement of the fight. If it sees this, it sees that pain as part of the fight, take it out on whatever it is it's doing. Shot collars force behavior because of the confusion of AC current for real. Now, what I'm going to do is eliminate that by using a pinch chain and a shot collar at the same time until. And literally what I do is, is pinch harder first and, and shock with a stimulant light. Then I'll flip it to where I shock first to see if the dog does the action. And pinch light, once the dog always performs it with a light stimulus, he is, it. the shock collar becomes an e-collar, a training device to where he understands it because he respects it on a low level. At that point, if we turn it up, we can turn it up some and it will reinforce the behavior at long range, but we're not turning it up so high to confuse the dog's mind. Does that make sense? Because it's real. It's raw. It's wriggling. 
Now I make sure my dog is shot collar married. And then I do a session in the backyard where I've done a pinch chain. Same thing as I've done before with a lean meat treat, but I use a low stimulant on that. And that's it, guys. If you got a real stubborn one, I'll use a long rope and a shot collar out by a woods or where I know. That dog, if he's a coon dog, is you can't stop him from hunting. It's already setting his muscle memory. Okay. So since that's setting the muscle memory, you can do come here all day long. When you go to the woods, he's still going to go hunt deep. Okay. If we're doing come here with young pups, we just make sure we do the disconnect. They're still going to hunt deep. But with ultimate come here, you just use a shot collar in that manner, same manner with a little distractions and you can get ultimate come here. I will be writing that up though. So that way disabled men like myself can hunt longer in life using these communication tools. And then we're going to get into some long range telemetry. If my dog can hear a word, I say they're going to do it every time. So now this, the technology exists for a whole new world of possibilities. I just have to hold my health and I'm working on it and I'm doing it. <laughs> um, I know that was a little scattery. Sorry, guys. That's just a little look into my brain. What happens after you get it electrocuted? It's taken me 20 years just to get back to talk this good. <laughs> But I'm proud of everything I do. I've made all the mistakes. I'm making mistakes every day. And it's just going to allow me to make less and get this information to you more flawlessly. Okay, guys. I am extremely passionate about this. The things I know will change the entire dog training world. I don't know just why I know. But healing from electrocuted, I can remember every dog I've ever trained in high death. So I can access tens of thousands of dogs and what it took to train them, what the past scenarios took, what the rhythms were. So that way I understand, hey, if we're disciplining a dog for off game, we have to praise it that night for a coon. Otherwise, that dog don't learn. This has allowed me, saving these dogs over the years has allowed me to learn. And then healing from electrocuted has allowed me to, to access memory that I shouldn't have. And then studying brain, dog, we all use hormones for everything, okay? We are our hormones, adolescents, teenager, terrible twos in a dog. OK. These things can all be worked through. So just like if a child starts to get oinery, we don't just put it in a thing. We work through it. If I have a young dog that's in terrible twos, I don't just put him up to mature. Yes, his hormones can level out, but I'm going to do something with him because maturity comes with experience. Anytime the dog's just sitting in a kennel. It's not learning anything. Always remember, wild predators have to do this before they're seven, eight months old. This is their learning time for hunting when they're young. But remember, guys, these techniques will allow you to start dogs young. Okay. I start puppies at 12 weeks old, tracking and treeing, once and where they're just tracking tree scent. Now, generally, like with that, I don't even use sight at all. I'll just use that treat and track thing. And I use an extreme treat to get them to tree and on the scent. Now, one thing is with that treats and track, this is how you train every dog. So if you guys want deer dogs, you ain't got to buy that book from Cabela's. <laughs> just tell your buddies to tune in. So if you are a person that wants to go find a buck for a guy and make 300 bucks a night, this is how you do it. It's this easy. Find a pay treat that your dog you want to track, blood track deer goes absolutely crazy over, okay? Do the tra same track and training where you use blood and the treat. Blood and the treat. Make the trail go thinner as you get there. That's most important. If there's blood, if the deer's bleeding really good, we find it. So you always wanna make your tracks with less blood as the training goes. And then you're just gonna lay that track nice and easy for little pups with a pile of the treats, okay, at the end of it with 
some good blood right there, okay? And just use the blood of the game you want them to blood track. It's that easy. And you just let them do it a few times and let them do it some more. It's, and then as you do it, take the treats away to where the treats aren't along the track as much. They're just at the end. Now what happens is, is no, the dog don't just eat the deer. He's going to look for the treats. He's used to ballpark Franks, not Harry Venison. <laughs> then if you want, you can even teach the dog to speak and teach him to locate to where literally he barks because it's there, like a dog bays. And that you just teach him speak. And um, there's a little bit more to that. But yeah, that's how easy it is. Every pay tree, every dog has a key, an ignition key. Okay. That is a lean meat tree that that dog goes crazy over. Now, if it ain't a lean, dogs have a sweet tooth. Could be an oatmeal cream pie, doesn't matter. We're just going to use a small piece of something that it absolutely loves, can taste, and it ain't filling up a stomach so we can train and not worry about flipping stomachs. Okay. And we have fun with it. But yeah, guys, those, that, those, those things right there will get you astronomical results. And, uh, and yeah, come here is exceptionally easy to do. And it saves so many dogs a butt whipping. It saves us so much aggravation. We're tired. We've been up all night. That's a good pup. We've been searching for it for three days. And we could have spent a whole 20 minutes in the yard. <laughs> okay, guys. Thank you guys for tuning in. This has been awesome. Next weekend, we're going to be in here and I'm going to go over some very important puppy information and how I look into these things while I'm starting the puppies. So that way I know what I'm spending my time on. Okay, guys. Hey, I thank you very much. And um, I know this information will put you guys in a whole another dimension of coon hunting. Get your problems done. Get your dog started out of want when they're developing. Between six months old and a year and a half is the most important time. Every dog starts picking up and learning more somewhere in that bell curve. Every dog is a little different. Usually it's right around 11, 12 months old, you know, to 15, 18 months old is when you can really, really make huge progress with anything. Anything they're learning, anything that they're finishing. Um, it completely takes all the scold on pups out, takes all the fear out before we hit the woods. And I've only showed him a coon just briefly. And I've made sure not to make any problems, only progress. And then I observe that rule. I don't show him a cage coon again until they can do it right. And then I break it. Once my young dog is night champion quality, then I'll get the cage coon out. And I'll take it through razor's edge. So just like a squirrel dog trees a squirrel, but if the squirrel moves, the squirrel watches it with its eyes and moves to the correct tree. This adrenaline control equates to accuracy because my dog's going to do the same thing the squirrel dog does, but he's going to do it with his nose. That's what every legend in accuracy does. You don't tree just because scent went up. It'll circle that tree and it'll find the body of the coon. Yeah, heck yeah. It'll circle that tree and it'll find the body of the coon before it ever locates. Um, all right, guys, I'm going to sign off here and we will be back on next Saturday and we'll do it to it till it's done. Thank you, guys. Over and out.